In several engineering applications such as furnaces and cooling towers, heat is transferred between the object's surface and the seemingly stationary surrounding fluid. Under these conditions, where the fluid region is enclosed between the surfaces that are at different temperatures, natural convection is the dominant mode of heat transfer between the walls and the fluid. For example, in a natural draft cooling tower, the fluid removes heat from the source and rises. This rising fluid is replaced by the surrounding cooler fluid and the process continues. In this lesson, we will understand the fundamentals of natural convection in enclosures and learn to estimate the overall natural convective heat transfer in three canonical places, rectangular cavity, concentric cylinders, and concentric spheres. Interested? Let's learn. A space heater inside a rectangular room relies on natural convective currents to heat the room and is a good example of natural convection inside a rectangular enclosure. Consider a rectangular cavity with dimensions L, W and H. In this cavity, the two opposite walls are at temperatures T1 and T2 as highlighted here, such that T1 is greater than T2. The other four walls of the cavity are assumed adiabatic. This temperature difference is responsible for the natural convection and the total heat flux transferred across the cavity is given by the following relationship. When the cavity is viewed from the side, the height of the cavity H is at a tilt angle with the horizontal plane. When this tilt angle is zero, the cavity is horizontal and the bottom wall is heated. When tau is 90 degrees, the cavity is vertical with the side wall heated. The heat transfer due to the natural convection in a horizontal cavity is very different from the vertical cavity. In addition to the tilt angle, the overall heat flux in these enclosures also depends on the aspect ratio of the cavity, H over L, and W over L. The fluid flow behavior is a strong function of the Rayleigh number, the non-dimensional number which dictates when a flow transitions to turbulence. Let us first look into the horizontal rectangular cavities where tau is equal to zero. For thin slender cavities with H over L and W over L much greater than one, and Rayleigh numbers lower than a critical value of 1708, the buoyancy forces are not strong enough to overcome the viscous resistance offered by the fluid. Under these conditions, there is no advection of fluid and the primary modes of heat transfer across the cavity are conduction and radiation, if any. The Nusselt number in this scenario is approximately equal to 1. As the Rayleigh number increases beyond the critical value of 1708, the buoyancy force due to the density difference between the hot and the cold fluid regions can overcome the viscous resistance experienced by the fluid. The fluid begins to circulate inside the cavity and the overall heat transfer is augmented because of the natural convection. For modest Rayleigh numbers ranging between 1708 and 50,000, an interesting flow pattern is observed inside the rectangular cavity. The motion of the fluid creates a pattern of uniformly spaced counter-rotating roll cells within the cavity. This uniform pattern of fluid motion transitions to turbulence at larger Rayleigh numbers. The following correlation for the average Nusselt number is provided by Globe and Dropkin to quantify the heat transfer in horizontal rectangular cavities. This correlation is applicable for thin cavities where H over L is much greater than 1. Also, 
The fluid properties are estimated at an average temperature between T1 and T2. Finally, no natural convection can exist when the top wall is at a higher temperature compared to the bottom wall. This implies that the only modes of heat transfer inside a rectangular cavity with a tilt angle of 180 degrees are conduction and radiation, if any. Similar observations can be made in the case of vertical rectangular cavities, that is where tau is 90 degrees. In this case, two of the opposing side walls are maintained hot and cold. The other four walls, including the top and bottom, are adiabatic. Until a critical Rayleigh number of about 1000, the buoyancy force is not strong enough to overcome the viscous resistance and the Nusselt number is approximately equal to 1. As the Rayleigh number increases beyond 1000, a recirculating flow is observed inside the vertical enclosure such that the fluid rises and falls near the hot and cold walls respectively. This cellular flow in the enclosure is stronger near the boundary layer regions closer to the hot and cold walls. The fluid is relatively stagnant in the core region of the cavity. It is important to highlight that additional cells can develop near the corners of the enclosure. As the Rayleigh number increases further, the fluid flow transitions to turbulence. The following average nusselt number correlations are useful in quantifying the overall natural convection in vertical channels. These correlations cover a broad spectrum of enclosure aspect ratios. Let us now switch gears from rectangular enclosures to concentric cylinders. Consider a cylindrical boiler heating water where the inner cylinder is the heating element. In this example, before water starts to boil, the heat transfer is primarily driven by natural convection inside the concentric cylindrical enclosure. As shown in this illustration here, heat is transferred between the inner and the outer cylinders across the annular space between them. The circulation of fluid in this space depends on whether the inner cylinder is hotter or colder compared to the outer cylinder. When the inner cylinder is hotter than compared to the outer, that is, Ti is greater than To, the fluid moves in the cavity such that it rises along the inner cylinder wall and falls along the outer cylinder wall. This motion creates a recirculating region inside the annular space between these cylinders. This motion is reversed if the outer cylinder is hotter compared to the inner. To estimate the heat flux across the annular region between these two concentric cylinders, we will recall the conduction heat transfer relationship for annular cylinders. Note that the thermal conductivity in this relationship is replaced by an effective thermal conductivity based on the stationary fictitious fluid. If we use this relationship to estimate the heat transfer due to natural convection in the annular space between the cylinders, then the value of the effective thermal conductivity must be estimated to ensure that the fictitious stationary fluid is transferring the same amount of heat as the real moving fluid. As per this condition, the following correlation for the effective thermal conductivity was developed. This relationship depends on the fluid Prandtl number and the flow Rayleigh number based on an effective length scale LC. Here, LC is given by the following equation. It is important to understand that the effective thermal conductivity relationship is valid only if K effective is larger than the thermal conductivity of the fluid. When K effective over K is less than 1, the fluid thermal conductivity should directly be used in the analysis. This ensures that the heat transfer rate with natural convection is not lower than the limit imposed by fluid conduction. 
Now, moving on to the last part of the lesson, the concentric spherical enclosure. The motion of hot and cold parcels of air from and to the Earth's surface respectively in the planetary circulation is a good example of natural convection in a concentric spherical enclosure. This motion leads to the formation of convection cells in the atmosphere around our planet. We will use a similar conduction heat transfer based approach to analyze and estimate the natural convection heat transfer rate across the concentric spheres. From the conduction theory, the following relationship is used to account for the heat flux crossing the enclosed space between the inner and the outer spheres. The value of the effective thermal conductivity is given by the following equation. The length scale employed to estimate the Rayleigh number is provided by the following relationships. It is important to note that all properties must be estimated based on the average temperature between the inner and the outer sphere wall temperatures. We have to understand that the heat transfer rate due to natural convection cannot be smaller than the conduction value and therefore we impose a limit on the effective thermal conductivity. If the value of effective thermal conductivity is smaller than the fluid thermal conductivity, we use the fluid thermal conductivity value in the analysis. This brings us to the end of the lesson.